This lecture addresses the question of how life got started on land. The implications are big because the land surface is home to much of Earth's biodiversity. Land plants also set the chemistry of the oceans and the atmosphere through their amplification of weathering and carbon burial. And as we shall see, the land biota governs big climatic swings as well. Life probably got started early on land. There are cyanobacteria living inside of rocks in Antarctica today as an analog situation to the early Earth. Cyanobacteria are also found in many terrestrial habitats, ranging from crusts and deserts to the formation of green and red snow. In addition, there is a fossil record of freshwater communities as far back as the Tumbiana Lakes in Australia at 2.6 billion years ago. But when it comes to fully terrestrial communities, our oldest fossil record is mostly indirect. There are three types of data suggesting the appearance of an extensive land biota by between 700 and 800 million years ago. One is the clay example I started class with. Clay formation implies the fixation of enough organic carbon to form humic acids in abundance. These acids weather feldspars and other minerals into clay. This mechanism has been challenged by those who argue that clay can be generated by abiotic processes too, not just those involving plant-derived humic acids. This critique is valid, to a point, but the fact is that in terms of volume, claystones are a phanerozoic phenomenon, not a Precambrian one, suggesting that plants have tipped the balance in favor of clay formation from what it once was. A second line of evidence is the carbon isotope ratios of organic carbon in nearshore sedimentary rocks. Typical marine organic matter has an isotope ratio of, say, negative 20 per mil, while land plants are typically negative 27 to negative 30 per mil. Nowth and Kennedy, 2009, looked at carbon isotopes in marine carbonates through time and argued for a change in terrestrial organic matter input to the oceans about 800 to 850 million years ago. Unfortunately, the isotope evidence that they present is also consistent with freshwater algae or intertidal to estuarine algae as the organic carbon source, not necessarily land plants per se. The third argument, which in my opinion is pretty good, is a shift in the late Precambrian from deposition by braided rivers to meandering river systems. Braided rivers form when there's nothing to hold sediment in place, like vegetation. So these are common in deserts and glaciated areas. Meandering rivers, in contrast, form where vegetation holds sediment in floodplains. The floodplains of meandering rivers are also usually clay dominated, so this argument partly duplicates my first point. The bottom line is that it's up to you uh, to look uh, for the first plant fossil evidence in 500 to 800 million year old rocks. It is probably just a matter of time before we find those early land plants. The evidence for early land plant origins from rivers, carbon isotopes, and clay um, supports or gains some support from molecular clocks. Molecular phylogeny suggests land plants originate from green algae. There is also a major split about a billion years ago that leads from green algae to fungi, according to Heckman et al. 2001. And indeed, there are fossils of fungi reported recently by Laurent et al. 2019 that date between 890 million years to about a billion years old. Heckman et al. 2001 a molecular analysis suggests that vascular plants, namely those with some means of transporting water within their tissues, appear about 700 million years ago. Sound familiar? This is about the same time frame for diversification of animals and the rise in atmospheric oxygen in the Neoproterozoic. The date also overlaps the Sturtian snowball event. Now, when Heckman et al. 2001 first published a Neoproterozoic date for land plants, there was a lot of back and forth in the literature, because fossils of land plants do not turn up until about 475 million years ago. So a 225 million year separation between fossils and molecular dates is a pretty big difference. Still, those old dates just keep coming back. For instance, Clark et al. 2011 revisited the fossil calibration points by picking high and low calibration bounds. They find that the liverwort stomatophyte split is about 670 million years ago, and the moss tracheophyte split, when we first get vascular plants, is about 635 million years ago. 
While the terms may be unfamiliar, the key point is that a liverwort is a perfectly good land plant. So Clark's molecular study lines up strongly with Heckman's original evidence and the geologic data I started this video with. Now we turn to the problems that plants had in becoming terrestrial in the first place. They probably started in freshwater ponds or rivers, but the leap from being supported by water to having to support themselves on land is not a trivial one. For instance, a big problem is desiccation, namely drying out. Part of the solution is to develop waxy cuticles that hold water in the plant and also to develop vascular tissue to transport water internally. Plants also lose water when they photosynthesize, largely because they need to take in CO2 for photosynthesis and they need to dump oxygen as a waste product. And both efforts also open the plant to water loss. Plants manage gas exchange and water loss using stomata. Stomata are holes in the leaves whose diameter is controlled by shrinking and swelling of bean-shaped guard cells. Uh, regulation of water and gas exchange through the stomata controls the osmotic pressure inside the plant between its roots and its leaves, which allows the plant to move water, gases, and nutrients around inside itself. Another difficulty plants have is reproduction. Some of the earliest plants need water in, uh, for their gametes to swim in but eventually the solution is wind dispersal of spores and pollen and later transportation of pollen by pollinators. Eventually plants also develop seeds that fully separate reproduction from surface water. Perhaps an even bigger problem is not getting cooked by ultraviolet radiation, that is being sunburned. Liquid water just a few centimeters deep is effective at shielding aquatic plants from UV radiation, but plants on land do not have that protection. Instead, land plants use pigments as sunscreen, in this case uh, chemicals called flavonoids. Flavonoids taste bad, as it turns out, and so they end up doing double duty to both reduce herbivory as well as to being a sunscreen for the plant. Of course, a plant also needs some way to get nutrients into the plant. Algae have it easy since they're just floating around in a nutrient-rich broth, but land plants need roots and some way to extract nutrients from rock and soil. They do this by forming a symbiotic association with arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, also known as AM fungi, that contribute to nutrient uptake from soils and decaying organic matter. The earliest known AM fungi come from the Gutenberg Formation in Wisconsin of mid ordovician age, around 460 to 455 million years ago. The use of this fossil find is a tie point in molecular phylogenies, suggest the major fungal groups diverged about 600 to 620 million years ago, <laughs> that date again, and suggest that AM fungal associations were established early, well before the rise of vascular plants. Finally, another big challenge of land plants is staying upright against gravity. They do this by elaborating their use of lignin, a stiff organic molecule that is one big constituent in wood. Lignin is a prime part of specialized cell walls of something called tracheids, which are the water transporting cells in plant stems. Tracheids are typically no more than 80 microns in diameter, but wider cells turn out to be much more efficient in fluid transport. In angiosperms, that is in the flowering plants, tracheids are up to 500 microns wide and get this, 10 meters long. Let that sink in, a cell about 30 feet long. You could definitely win a beer in a bar for that one. A big issue in tracheids is cavitation, where the tracheids get an air bubble stuck in them, which is often caused by freezing. Plants go to some trouble, therefore, to prevent air embolism like this, including having sieve plates and tiny pores in the tracheid walls that are too small for air bubbles to pass through. In summary, land plants probably get started much earlier than we have a fossil record, perhaps 100 to 200 million years earlier, in fact. The first land plants were probably liverwort-like things, living in areas that were at least seasonally wet. Hence, a lot of the land surface area was either barren or populated by cyanobacterial crusts, uh, as it had been back into the Archean. If molecular clocks are right, the first terrestrial plants get started in a glaciated landscape, and the mere fact of this suggests that our fossil record, if there is one, is likely to be found in the cap carbonates or post-glacial deposits of the Neoproterozoic snowball events. 
But then, as animals become big in the oceans, the land plant record gets dramatically better, and a lot of the big and major innovations in dealing with the challenges of land life are established by the time the first forests appear, about 390 years.